been a while. Seven years ago. Wow, man, it's good to see you again. And uh, it's good that you brought a friend with you today, Matt. It's Matt, right? I want to hear your story, man, after we're done and we're at fellowship dinner. Well, hey, why don't we uh, have another quick prayer here? I'm going to ask God just to be with us. God, without you, we can do nothing. I pray that you just uh, help this message today be a challenge, to be an encouragement, and help us to be about your business. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I really believe today we always need faith. Whatever we go through trials in life, and we all have trials, we all have those fiery darts thrown at us by the devil. We need to have faith and confidence that God cares about us and that he's real, especially in these last days. Do you believe that we're living near the Christ coming, the soon return. I believe it with all my heart. In fact, you know, he asked, Jesus asked an interesting question in Luke 18. He says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? You know, I, I, that's why I like this promise here in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where you have scripture reading. But turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. This is not on the screen, so if you want to look at it, you can, or you can just listen. Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now we got to remember that when we're going through the trials, when we're going through those fiery times that just try our faith, we got to remember that there is a God in heaven and that this God really cares. He cares about your finances. Have you ever had a fiery trial where you felt like like you was, your back was up against the wall and your finances, you lost your job, you couldn't pay the bills, the bill collectors are coming. Where is God? I don't know if any of you have had that experience. Or maybe it's in the area of relationships. You've got a spouse uh, and things are not really going quite well. Maybe it's your children or maybe it's your co-workers that you work with. You know, God, help me with these relationships. Maybe it's in the area of health. The doctor has just come up to you and said, I hate to tell you this, but you've got stage four cancer. Man, those words fall on you like a heavy weight. And you know, in life, there are times when we face a mountain, a problem, a challenge, and it doesn't seem sometimes there's enough steps to climb the top of that mountain to get over it. Have you ever been there where the mountain of trouble is insurmountable, or it seemed like it? I mean, I believe today, and what I want to encourage you, I believe in a God that is real. I believe in a God that still does miracles. I believe in a God that still moves mountains. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the demons must flee. Do you believe in that type of a God? I do. But I tell you what, there's been times that I've had my faith a little bit shaken. Uh, I tell you, the devil wants to smash you through those trials. Now, when those trials come, when those fiery darts are being thrown at you, you've got to stand on the Word of God. You've got to stand on the promises of God. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. And Satan doesn't want you to be saved. He doesn't want you in heaven. He wants you to throw in the towel. Give it up, man. You'll never make it. You got to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. You know, to be honest with you, like I've said, I struggled sometimes in my faith. I, I mean, it's one thing to come here and things are going fairly well and to sing, he's able, he's able to carry me through. But when you're going through a tough, tough situation, you might want to sing the song, this time, Lord, you gave me a mountain, a mountain that I 
can never climb. I kind of felt that way in Delaware. I was working in Kansas. I was born in Kansas. I became a, a Seventh-day Adventist. Man, I was on fire for the Lord. And so I joined the literature work, selling our books. And uh, I got a call to go out to Delaware and sell out there. My boss went out there and he says, man, it's gravy train out here. The leads just roll in. It's the promised land. I mean, that's the picture he painted to me. So I went out there. And I ain't kidding you not, through God's grace, for the first six months, I was at the top of the sales charts. But then all of a sudden, it was like somebody took the rug and just pulled it out from under my feet. I mean, the sales went down. Delinquent accounts went up. <laughs> my house that I was renting in Leavenworth, Kansas, the renters weren't paying rent and they tore the house up. All this stuff was happening. And then, uh, you know, I had a, two little children. I had my wife. And uh, it got down to really, uh, you know, how am I going to get through this? I could pay the bills. I paid my tithe and offering. Uh, what little offering I could, and then I had about $10 or $20 left over. And uh, we would go to the grocery store, and if anything was over $10 or $20, had to put it back. I can remember going down the road and seeing this vegetable fruit stand, and I stopped just to see what they had. They had a 50-pound bag of potatoes for $5. Well, you can't even hardly buy five pounds for $5 now. <laughs> not, but I bought those potatoes, and we had some gluten flour, and for the next three months, it was a tough, tough ride. We only had, a, you know, that's all we ate was potatoes and gluten steaks three times a day. And I tell you what, I like potatoes potatoes, and I like gluten steaks, but I like a little variety now. <laughs> and so, I, I can remember it was so tough, I would, uh, didn't even have money to put in the car one day for gas, and it was just running on fumes. I went up to the road where a trailer court was, and I sold some paperbacks, and I had enough money now that I could put a little gas in the tank. It was a tough time, but God brought me through that tough time. And the scriptures came alive. You know, I used to think the guy that wrote the Psalms was a just a crybaby. <laughs> but when I started reading the Psalms, they, they became so precious to me because he talked about his trials and how God came through for him. And God is still in the business of coming through for us. And these end times, we're going to have to know God now in the little things we go through if we're going to stand tall for Jesus in the time before Jesus returns, the time of trouble such as never was. You know, there was a father in the Bible that was having a tough time with faith. He came up to the disciples of Jesus Christ. He says, I've got a son and he's demon possessed. And th this demon throws him in the fire. He throws him into the water. He gnashes his teeth. He does all these things. He, he foams at the mouth. And so the disciples prayed, but they could not get rid of that demon. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, what's going on? Jesus knew what was going on. But anyway, the father explained to him what was going on. We read about it in Mark chapter 9 verse 22 talking about his son. He says and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But notice what the father says next. He says but if you can do anything have compassion on us and help us. Notice Jesus reply. Jesus said to him <coughs> Ah, if you can believe, some things are possible. Is that what it says? All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now there's been times that I had to say that prayer. When I was going through that stuff in Delaware and at the apex of all that happening, my boss knew I was having a rough time. He dug some food out of the freezer and gave it to me. And he knew that I was a proud person, that I didn't ask for help. And he says, you take this or I'm giving you one of these. I went down the road and I was angry at God. Have you ever been angry at God? Wondered where he was at? What? No, I'm ashamed to say it, but that I have to think the psalmist went through the same thing and others. So God, though, did bring me through that situation. And in these last days, God's going to bring us through 
other challenges, not just personal ones, but church challenges. You've got Winchester and you've got Deckard here. And uh, I tell you what, God wants to display his power on the people in this community. He wants to use you if you put aside your fears like Moses it was brought up by our Sabbath school teacher this morning Moses was fearful to be the deliverer of Israel but God had called Moses and Moses says well I can't speak I can't do this and you may feel like that this morning but God wants to use you everybody in this room has a gift and has a talent. Don't be just a pew warmer. It's time to rise up and be a mighty army for God, especially with Jesus coming so soon. I believe that with all my heart. And uh, you know what happens to those that bury their talents, don't you? It's not a pretty picture. You ought to read Matthew 25. Those that bury their talents, there will be, they will be thrown in outer darkness and there will be gnashing and grinding of teeth that doesn't sound too pretty. We want to be a faithful servant. We want to have hearts that visit the sick, that visit those in prison, that set the free those that are in the prison house of sin. And so we need to be about our Father's business. How many people do you have in this territory? Maybe 10,000, Winchester, Deckard. Let's just round it off, 10,000 people population-wise. And so do you think God's strong enough to win 10% of those people? How many of you believe that God's strong enough to win 10%? Well, a lot of you do. And maybe, you know, your God's not that strong. Do you think he can win uh, 1% of those 10,000? What would 1% of 10,000 people be? That would be 100 people, wouldn't it? Am I right? Uh, so, can you imagine a hundred people? Would you have to have a couple of more services? I know I, I don't know what kind of a God that you have, but I don't serve a 95-pound weakling. I serve the Almighty God. And when the gifts of God's Holy Spirit come upon us and we use, maybe your gift is playing piano. Maybe it's the gift of hospitality. Maybe it's teaching the children. What I'm trying to say is every gift is just as important as the gift of evangelism or pastor or teaching and my friends even those that keep the the land here nice and clean that's a gift that's a talent thank God for your ministry because when people drive by they judge you uh, somewhat on the the appearance of the property and stuff and you got a, a nice facility but I'm just trying to say use the gift you got you know when I came back to Memphis Tennessee let me back that up here I used to pastor Memphis First Church 20 years ago and when I left there was 180 some people attending church. When I came back last summer during my retirement, I was sad to see after COVID there was only 35 in attendance. Now that's rose up some to 65 to 70, but not to what it used to be when I pastored that church. And anyway, so we got a work to do. The Raleigh Church, that's a sister church of ours, got together with me and our personal ministry team. Let's join forces. Let's try to uh, encourage people to use their gifts and talents and let's do things for the community. Let's do outreach. So we uh, made plans. We presented them to the board. Since the March of this year, we've done nine cooking classes and wellness classes. And through God God's grace, we're making connections, we're making friends. Yeah, it may not win souls, but in a way it does because it opens up doors. I get to meet people, connect with those people. I'm telling you that soul winning, 95% of it or better, is about relationship. In the real estate world, it's location, location, location. But in our world, it's about relationship, relationship, relationship. And so well, now we're, our next thing is the Delta Fair. We're going to have a fair booth there, just like Murphy's. Uh, give away a free family Bible, have drawing cards, and on those drawing cards they can sign up for depression recovery, diabetes undone, marriage seminar, uh, Bible prophecy, Bible studies, whatever. And then to finish it all off, we're going to have Dakota Day come in and between three churches, the Hispanic Church, the Raleigh Church, the Memphis First Church, we're going to pull together and have an evangelistic meeting. You know, you got to sow seed you got to fertilize it. you got to water it uh, if you want the harvester to harvest anything. Next uh, year, we're going to do the depression recovery program, diabetes undone. But, you know, sometimes we think, oh, when 
a hundred people here in Winchester. That's, you must be smoking. What have you been smoking, pastor? <laughs> No, I haven't been smoking. I just believe and have confidence that God wants to do great things through his people. And that's what we need to do. There's a lesson to learn from the 12 spies. There's a lesson we can learn from all these stories in the Bible. They were written there for our learning so that we might have hope. They went out spying the promised land and they brought back a bunch of grapes, a cluster of grapes. They had to carry it between two guys on a pole. And they talked about at first positive stuff. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, you should see it. It is awesome. But right away, it started turning negative. Ten of the spies said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. There we saw the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. They went on and talked about the fortified cities. The walls are high. The giants are too big. And maybe you feel that way. Your responsibility is this area. My responsibility is the Memphis area uh, that God has given us to tackle. My friends, God God wants to do God-sized things, not man-sized things. And yes, it seems slow at times. It seems like there's just a dribble or even less than a dribble. But you hang in there. You wrestle with God like Jacob wrestled with the angel. You don't let go until God blesses you. And so, that's so, so important. I get carried away and I was praying. I went backwards. God had promised them. Now, I'm glad that Caleb was there, that Joshua was, was there, because they had this to say. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Not in his power. He knew that it was in God's power. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The greatest thing I believe that the church can do right now is pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what's lacking. It's not knowledge. Uh, we have lots of knowledge, just like the scribes and Pharisees. We've got the commandments. We've got Sabbath keeping and we pay tithe. Uh, but I tell you what, it was Sabbath keeping, tithe paying people that nailed to the cross. What's missing in the Adventist church is the agape love of God. And in Ephesians, what a great book. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays that we might understand the width and the height and the depth of the love of God, that we might be filled with the fullness of God. And I'm not talking about a cup. I'm talking about Niagara Falls. That's what we need. We need Niagara Falls in our church. You know, the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they preached this message with great zeal and enthusiasm and power. And we're told that the work of God will be finished in greater zeal and power. But they were afraid to go in. Even though they seen God work incredible miracles, the opening of the Red Sea, closing it up, killing their enemies. They had seen bread from heaven, water come out of a rock. But they didn't have enough faith. They didn't have enough confidence to enter the Promised Land. I tell you what, if God promises something, you know it's according to His will. And brother, I appreciate you so much asking, I want to quit smoking. I'm telling you that God, through Jesus Christ, you can be more than a conqueror through Him. If God be for us, who can be against us? Is it according to His will for us to quit habits that destroy us? Absolutely. So you can stand in faith, and you may not feel a bunch of energy going through you. Oh boy, I... I, I feel so different. My friends, you, you may not feel so different, but you claim it by faith. God has answered that prayer. I remember in Tulsa, Oklahoma, holding evangelistic meetings, and this man says, at the end of the meetings, I want to be baptized, but I've been smoking, and I, I don't feel like I should be baptized until I quit smoking. I says, you're right. And so I prayed with him. I says, the Lord, the next time that he picks up a cigarette, make him puke, make him sick, and make him not ever want to touch it again. That next morning when he ate breakfast, you know what you always want to do after you eat something. He takes up and he takes a puff and he threw up. 
That was an answer to God. He waited for about six months, but he got baptized a little later on. My friends, God answers prayer. When we're not grasshoppers, we gotta, we're giant slayers. That's what we are through the power of God. And so God promised them that they could have the promised land. He said that in Exodus. He said that in other places, Deuteronomy. My friends, don't underestimate the power of prayer. Quit looking at the giants. Look to the God who calms the sea, who raises the dead. My friends, it's not my PowerPoint programs. It's not my speech. But it is the power of God. It's not microphones that's going to finish the work. It's not jet airplanes flying all over the world that's going to finish the work. Look at the disciples. Look what they had. They turned the world upside down over Jesus Christ and the gospel. My friends, they did it through the power of God. And it will happen. God's going to take the work in his own hands. And he will do a work through us like you have never seen. Through the simplest means he will do it that work. We got to quit looking at the giants. Keep our focus on Jesus. There's power in prayer. Do you believe that this morning? It says here in the Review and Herald, by your fervent prayers of faith, you can move the arm that moves the world. You know, I believe that the devil trembles when we pray. I also believe that the angels are amazed that we pray so little. I mean, prayer is the key that unlocks the treasures of heaven. If we'd only pray and not give up, the Bible talks about being persistent in our prayers, not letting go. With God by our side, we can see great miracles take place. Jesus says, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. He did it for David. You all know the story, of course. David, a shepherd boy, just a young shepherd boy. They try to put King Saul's suit of armor on him. Well, he's jangling around in that. He says, I can't wear this. And, he's, and he believes, he has confidence, he has trust in the God of heaven. All these other soldiers were afraid. And humanly, I could understand that. Who in the world would want to go against a nine foot, 11 foot giant or whatever he was. Anyway, David goes out there and this is what he says to the giant. He says, you, <clears throat> okay, let me back up. He says, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of David. Is that what he says? But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord might deliver you in my hand. Is that what he's, he has full confidence. He says, the Lord will deliver you in my hand. He wasn't doing it for his own glory. Hey, buddies, look what I did. I'm just a shepherd boy, but I knocked down that giant. He did it to show his enemies. He did it to show his fellow brethren the the power of God. He says, then, then when this happens, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's. God wants to display his greatness, his power to you and I if we step out in faith. When they crossed over to the promised land, that Jordan River was swollen uh, with a flood, but they had to step their foot in that river first before they could get across. That river stopped and they were able to go across just like they did with the Red Sea. We got to step out in faith. We got to say, Lord, you're going to help me. I've got a, I've got a, uh, I have a passion to pass out literature. You know what? Easy way to, for me to pass out literature, find a nature trail, wear a Christian shirt of some kind. Or if I see another person wear a Christian shirt, I says, hey, man, it looks like you're a Christian. I love your shirt. And they'll say, yeah. I says, well, hey, what do you think about the times we're living in? And I'll start a conversation, leave some literature with them. Or maybe they'll say to me, I like your Christian shirt. Are you a Christian? I says, yeah, are you? Yeah. And we just strike up a conversation. I was able to give out a whole box of Desmond Doss books whenever, and doing it that way, whenever a Desmond Doss movie came out, Hacksaw Ridge. But my, there's all kinds of things you can do. You have to sit there and be creative and dream a little bit and ask God, what do you want me to do? And then do it. My friends, God wants to work miracles from us. How 
big is your God? How large is he? How big is your faith in God today? I remember when I was ordained in 1993 in Iowa, Missouri conference, and they had HMS Richards Jr. there for the camp meeting. And he told some incredible stories of faith that happened to the voice of prophecy. He told one about Barrow, Alaska. He said that the money wasn't coming in and things were tight and they were going to have to take the program off the air in Barrow, Alaska. And so uh, a pastor there in Barrow, Alaska caught wind of this because he liked the voice of prophecy. He talked to his church board. He says, can we sponsor this program? It's such a blessing. And so they did. They sponsored the voice of prophecy. And at the end of the program, at the end of the broadcast, they would give credit to this church. This program today has been sponsored by the Presbyterian Church. Now, isn't that something? And the pastor said, don't worry about the money. If money gets tight, if it becomes an issue, if we have to, we'll go to the local Seventh-day Adventist church and see if they'll help. <laughs> well, it's a true story. There's not a wall too high. There's not a giant too big. Here's one that he told that I never forgot. There was a lady in Texas. She was taking the voice of prophecy lessons through the mail. And anyway, this representative from the Voice of Prophecy called up and said, how do you like your lessons? Do you have any questions? The lady says, this must be the Holy Spirit. And yes, we pray about the people we called, and we believe, yes, the Holy Spirit guides us. And she says, no, no, you don't understand. This is impossible. This is weird. And the Voice of Prophecy representative said, why? Why, why is it weird? She says, my phone has been disconnected for two weeks. I can't call out and nobody can call in. And yet, you're talking to me. Can God work miracles like that? God can work miracles. He wants to demonstrate that to each and every one of us. Have you ever seen a miracle? Have you ever seen the mighty hand of God? Are you willing to use your gift? If you really want to really make a difference in this community, man, be praying. That's number one. And then also be saying, God, show me my gift. And if you're not sure what that is, do you have a passion for something? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a passion to work in the background, which is, we need cooks, we need medics in the military. Uh, we don't need everybody to be on the front line, and everybody needs to be fed, and everybody needs uh, other things. What I'm trying to say is, Man, if you're a toe, then do what a toe is supposed to do. If you're a finger, then do what a finger is supposed to do. Just pull together and you'll see uh, uh, an energy take place that will, and pray for the Holy Spirit. That's most important than anything else that I could tell you today. What is His will? What do you think the will of God is? His number one will for planet Earth. What do you think? What's that? That's exactly right. Souls for his kingdom, to be saved. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. And he was willing to, even at age 12, when he told his mother and father, when he was in the temple, and he was showing all those scribes and Pharisees the scriptures and explaining them, he looked at his mom and dad. We know by the age of 12 he knew this, maybe earlier. He told his mom and dad, he says, I must be about my father's business. Are you, am I, about my, our Father's business? The purpose for your life, the purpose is not for me just to make a paycheck, it's to make a difference with the people, to be a light of God to them. If they're hurting, I can be a listening ear. If they're hurting, I can lift them up, possibly with encouraging words. Those are just as important as anything else. Be about your father's business. God, you might feel like you're weak. I can't do it because, you know, I can't speak. Not like Moses, I can't speak very well, and I can't do this, and I can't. Other people might think I'm dumb. I'm, I might look like a fool. Nobody looks more like a fool than I do sometimes. I can remember the first time I went out to do a canvas, you know, a sales talk with the Bible story company. I wanted to let people have good literature in their homes to raise their kids up. And I told my boss, I says, here's a little town way over here. I don't know anybody there. And if I look like a fool, I'm thinking to myself, who cares? They'll never see me again. So I go to the first door. And who comes to the door? A cousin of my wife. <laughs> 
I give my door approach, she lets me in. This is my first canvas, and I had learned that sales talk. I knew it verbatim, word for word. I never memorized anything in my life, but here I am showing that lady. I didn't even look up at her. I was sniffling because I was nervous. I didn't have a cold or anything. I was just nervous. And I asked all the right questions, went through that canvas verbatim. But she wasn't interested. She was not really into God, at least at that point in her life. So I had a prayer. We went outside, got in the car. I turned to my supervisor. I says, well, what do you think? Uh, did I do okay? He looked at me. He says, yeah, you, you did okay, except that every time you asked her a question, you said, isn't that right, Mrs. Jones? And see, that's what I learned in my sales talk. That wasn't her <laughs> real name. Isn't that right? I must have said that 40 times. What, I, I, what I'm trying to say by that story is if God can use me, He can use any of you. I know a guy that stutters real bad. His name is Stuart Lozinski. Maybe you know him uh, uh, in Oak Cliff. And Flo, Flo, he's not here anymore, but he wanted to be a literature evangelist. They said, no, you stutter too bad. He kept on persisting, so they let him. Became a successful literature evangelist. Became a publishing director. We hired him as a pastor in two different churches. Each church grew under his leadership, and then now he's the church growth director in Pennsylvania Conference. I'm telling you, God can use anything that is willing to be used. He can do. And God wants to work miracles. He wants to show His miracle, His miraculous hand. When we're weak and we feel weak, depend on God. Don't depend on your own power. You know, now I don't believe that Israel is any more special than any of us. But I'm just showing you that God has mercy. God has compassion. And, uh, you know, He loves these people just as much as He loves us. And they went through a lot during Germany, through the Holocaust, and they had lost their family. They lost their businesses. It was unbelievable. They became a nation on May 14th, 1948. On that very day, five Middle East countries went to war against this new nation, one day old. How in the world are they going to stand up against an established military and established countries? Five countries went after them. They thought, well, that's the end of that. That lasted a long time, one day. But but miracles of miracles, somehow they prevailed against all odds. I think God had mercy. God had compassion on these downtrodden people. And then in 1967, there were three countries that went to war with them. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, from the north to the east and the south. They were lined up on their borders. Artiller, artillery, uh, tanks, and uh, military men. They were on the borders. Everybody knew that this was the end of Israel. Israel was digging. Some of them were digging mass graves in their national parks. This is going to be a massacre. And so Israel decided to do a preemptive strike. They called it uh, Operation Mokad. And so they got into their planes, the Air Force. And they got into their airplanes and they left only 12 behind to protect Israel. And they flew, the whole Air Force flew 20 meters above the ground, trying to avoid the radar. They hit and knocked out five Egyptian airports, 300 airplanes, and only lost one airplane in the process. God can do miracles. He's a living God. He's not a dead God. Whenever those giants were in the land, they were crying around about it. Oh, the giants are too big. Do you think God was there and saying, hmm, I didn't know there was giants over there. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do about this. God had it all under control. I'm trying to encourage you to take this work, the work that God has given us. He says this to us. It's a promise from God in Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He says, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. I wonder this morning, do you hear a little voice somewhere inside your head, somewhere in your heart that says, step up. 
believe in me. I'm going to work through you. You can reach people that Keith Knoll can't reach. You can reach people that Cliff and Flo, Flo can't reach. You can reach people. God wants to use every one of us for His work. It's time for you to take this area for Jesus Christ. Turn this area upside down through prayer, through belief that God can use you. Will you dare to believe in that God of miracles that they can still happen? that God can still move mountains and that in His name demons must flee. It's time to think faith, speak faith, act on faith. God is trying to bring together an army and it can only happen under the latter rain. The latter rain will fall and many of our people will know nothing at all about it. That's what she says. God will have an army that will go forth. Fair has the moon, clear has the sun, and terrible is an army with banners. At the end of your life, don't be like, don't have any regrets like Schindler did. Uh, in the last part of that movie of Schindler's List, he spent his whole fortune trying to free the Jews. He, he, he freed hundreds, maybe thousands of Jews. And they were giving him a little present because the, uh, the enemy the, uh, were coming in. Hitler, his armies were coming in. They were going to arrest him. He was going to take off in his automobile. And uh, when they gave him that little present, he said, I could sell this, and that would be a couple of more souls. He says, I could sell this pin. It's made out of solid gold. That would be two more. I could sell my car. That would be five more people. And he started crying. My friends, don't have any regrets. You've got time now to use the gifts and talents you have. Use them through the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Be like Desmond Doss. Lord, Help me get one more. Lord, help me get one. Here he is exhausted. You know, he's only 150 pounds dragging wounded people, letting them down. Help me get one more. Help me get one more. That's all life is all about is a life of service. Oh, man, I just wish that we'd take this and embrace it with all of our hearts. I want to be part of that God's army. Do you want to be part of God's army today? Let's stand and close with prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Your love compels us to do your business. And that's be doing works of kindness, works of love. It's not just in their face with uh, the mark of the beast. And though that's important, and we need to get those messages out uh, at the right time and things. And God, give us discernment when to speak and when to shut up. I pray, God, that you would just help us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And like I said earlier, I don't want just a cup. I want Niagara Falls. For I ask it for us and these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, I think you had some announcements, sir. Oh, message, brother. What a powerful sermon.